that is posting verification. Who could do that? We also have Jacob Surtage of Wilkins ADP and Mark Lewis of BD Construction. So um, I think that covers everyone that is here. Um, Tobin had, was here last week. He was unable to attend tonight, so that's why we have Matt with us this evening. Um, some things that I would just uh, like to share real quick. Thank you for taking time out of your evening. You all have other commitments that you could be at tonight. But we are here because we care about our district. We care about the future of Juanita Palisade. And I don't take that lightly at all. Um, I shared last week I was a transplant. I did not grow up in this district, but very quickly I have become a Bronco. And um, I know many of you personally very well, and I know many of your children very well. And so tonight, when we start delving into all of this information, I would share with you we did not come across this overnight. Um, we have been working for this project for several years, and we have been saving money, utilizing the um, tools that we have available to us to begin looking at our facilities. So nothing new. Let's talk about the timeline if we could. Um, before I was on this board or even thought I wanted to run for school board, um, it was a vision of the school district to start talking about what should we do with our Palisade facility. And that all began in 2000. And I know that Lori served on that board, or that group, it wasn't a board, it was a committee, um, to start talking about what should we do with Palisade? Because it was, at that point in time, probably needing, starting to need some repair. So with that, Mr. Isom, who is no longer with us, formed a community committee to come up with um, some ideas and review what we could do. So then, in 2006, our building design was presented and the committee presents this new one-level building, and if I remember right, it was just a nice metal structure many of us have today on some farms, um, but would be very feasible and work with probably eight classrooms, um, and would house all those current classrooms, and no action was taken. So, fast forward to 2017. Um, we had asked BD to come and provide a facilities audit for um, our location. And the one big thing that continued to come out was Palisade was definitely in need of repair or in need of replacement. Um, and the only salvageable piece there in Palisade was our gym, um, just because that is the nature of the building. And then in 2021, we as a board started listening to what we were hearing from um, our ALCAP, which is our insurance individuals coming in and sharing with us, you've got some things that you probably need to really uh, pay attention to. So for those of you who have been in the district a long time, um, we had a flood probably in 2009 in the Palisade location, starting out on the third floor, third to the bottom. Um, that was an issue. Um, we also have had an, uh, 
an opportunity where we closed down school for two days because we had an electrical overload. Because today we are in a technology driven world and our building was not set up to handle that load of electricity. So the building didn't go up in smoke, thank goodness, but we did close school for two days so that we could have a firm come in and completely rewire. I'm sure some of you teachers may or may not remember that. Um, so those are some things that we continually are facing. We recently had a radiator fall off in the preschool room. Why the building didn't go up in smoke, I still don't know that either. Um, but there's, we, we've got an angel looking over us is my personal opinion. So with that, um, our board started putting our heads together and we have said, so now for 22 years, because here we are, it's 2022, and we're here to talk to you about a potential facility update. And the biggest question has been, how come we're focusing here in Juanita? Number one, it has the best footprint for us, or the best foundation. This building was built with brick and mortar and cement and iron, where our facility in Palisade was in this lucky. It is a stick build with a brick on the outside. There are several things that our custodians have done to upkeep so that we don't have windows breaking, walls crumbling in. And I want to applaud all of our teachers in that building. Um, never once have they come to us and complained about their environment that they're teaching in. And our students don't come home complaining either. All of my children have attended at that location and many of your children have as well. But we are at a point where that building today is 98 years old. And we are not, at this point in time, set up to say, what do we actually need to do? I think we know, but we haven't said publicly that we are ready to address that. We have not had leadership from a superintendent perspective saying I'm willing to take that on, and we haven't had board leadership either. So with that, um, the six of us started talking after our facilities audit when we learned, and this was a facilities audit. So all it said was, we're going to come in and review your facilities and we're going to give you some recommendations of what we think would be great. And that was from the first National Capital Markets Group. So they're an outside group. They don't know anything about our district, but they're going to walk through and they're going to look and do some things. So one thing that was shared was we run two facilities that can tend to be relatively expensive. Um, but we are pleasantly happy to report that we actually don't overspend crazy amounts compared to our peers. The other thing that was shared is we would be more efficient if we were running one location. And I think you all know what efficiencies look like. And so that was when we started talking, okay, so if we would be in one location, this is an if, what would that look like? So we asked these gentlemen to put some things together, and this is not something we're sharing, like the whole um, conceptual with you, but if we were, and this is just because this question came up last week, if we were to move everyone here, it would be a $10 million project. But we today do not have that financial backing to do that. So we said we can't afford to do that. Go back to your drawing board. And so Jacob and Mark went back and started looking at some other options, like what could we do? What could we do that would be within our current levy situation and that we could continue to be a viable district? And so when Jacob, when I turn over to Jacob, he will share that with you. But I wanted to share that with the group that's here tonight because that was a question that was asked. We didn't really have an opportunity to probably address it. We had some other questions that got interrupted. But also a big question was, what would we do with that Palisade facility if we vacated it? And that question is, we know it is not a safe structure long term. So as a school, we would make sure that that facility would be knocked down. Now the future of all those students, those are the things we're going to continue to look at. We're going to continue to evaluate. And so I wanted to share that with you. But we certainly wouldn't leave an eyesore in the town of Palisade when we know we have a building that is approaching 100 years old. Um, for those of you that know, it's probably the only school in the state of Nebraska that still has a safety chute if there were to be a fire. And I don't think that's probably very safe today. I was looking at it last week and I thought we should have enough carpets for all the kids to be able to slide out if that happened just because I'm a little worried it might hurt him going through it. But I just 
want you to know that there were some things that came up question-wise, and I really felt like we didn't have an opportunity to share that with you, and so I wanted to share that with you today. So as a board, we all said, all right, we can handle an eight million to an eight and a half million dollar project without hugely affecting where our tax base and levy is today. So, and our financial guys will share that with you too. So, some things that we learned as a board, because we are learning too. Any brand new construction has to come out of your special building fund. Anything that you would renovate, so anything that's current existing facility, that can come out of your general fund dollars. And we also have the ability with um, bringing things up for safety reasons, whether it's sprinkler, HVAC, um, security, we have an opportunity to also use what is called QC popped funds. And we have utilized that before. I forgot to share too, we did put in a nice new boiler in Palisade about 10 years ago-ish, maybe not quite that many, but we utilized the QC puff funds to um, pay for that project because at that point in time, we didn't have the financial stability to do it out of the general fund. So just some things that we are looking at, we're trying to be creative because when we first sat down with our facilities audit individuals, they, the first question they asked, tell me where you see your district. Do you want to be here in five years? Do you want to be here in 10 years? Or do you want to be here longer than that? And I spoke up and said, I would like to see our district still here in 50 years. We are encouraging all of our students that graduate from here to come back and be a viable part of our community. And without a place to educate their children, why would they want to come back? And so that's where we are today. And the merger between Juanita and Palisade happened 30 years ago. And I don't know that those two boards thought it would even last five years. But here we are today, 30 years later. And I would like to see this district still be here in 30 years for my grandchildren, for your grandchildren, Whatever that picture looks like, we have some awesome things happening here. When the merger first happened, you know we were C1, C2, and now we're looking at D1, D2 at best. And again, we are seeing a huge population decline, and that's because no one loves rural America as much as we do that are in this room. And we want to continue to encourage our kids to come back. We have great facilities where they can get great jobs. We have a great opportunity to educate them here. So here we are. As your board, we have said we want to be here, and I hope that you all will see that too. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jacob, and I'll let you walk through the design. And again, these are all conceptual plans. We have not signed one thing in ink, we don't have any construction plans, and we will not take any action tonight, nor did we take any action last week. So we are here to share our information, we're here to listen to your questions and your concerns, we will have another recap meeting in a few weeks to come back to you all and let you know what we heard you say and what your concerns were. So, with that, take it away. Thank you, Allison. Uh, again, I'm Jacob Sertich with Wilkins Architecture Design Planning uh, from Kearney. And I mentioned this last week, I want to mention it to this group again. So I've been here in the district uh, quite a few times now uh, since we've been hired by the district and I've really enjoyed every visit here, so thank you for uh, being so welcome, uh, welcoming and hospitable to, uh, to me as I've been here, so thank you. Um, so again, looking at, uh, at some of the, the focus tonight here is more so on, uh, on the Juanita campus here. So uh, on this slide here, I do want to just mention uh, and highlight some of the uh, deficiencies that have been identified here uh, with this campus. I would say uh, I've had uh, my structural engineer has uh, toured uh, and inspected both of the uh, both of the campuses, uh, and to Allison's point, uh, this this building in particular here uh, really does have have great bones, uh, good structure, very sound structure here, uh, and also as Allison mentioned, uh, really great infrastructure here in terms of uh, just what you have here with the facility and uh, the amount of space that you have here uh, really does uh, lend itself well to. Uh, to, to doing an addition, uh, but also looking at renovating and updating and taking care of, of some, of the, some, some of the deficiencies that have been identified uh, through the uh, facilities assessment. So, uh, so again, I don't want to talk as much about the, the Palisade uh, campus as much. Again, we've talked about that some, and Allison's talked about that, but 
again, uh, issues there with that nearly 100 year old building. Uh, but again, the focus here uh, for tonight will be mostly uh, with the Juanita campus. And so, as we look at uh, some of the deficiencies that have been identified, uh, some of these are probably pretty, uh, perhaps pretty, pretty readily apparent. Uh, others maybe not, uh, not as much, but um, certainly uh, there is a, a, a good portion of the facility that's not um, handicap accessible. Uh, and so, uh, and, and I'll address our plan for, uh, for how we would take care of these issues. I'll, uh, I'll address those uh, coming up uh, here shortly when, uh, when I show you the concept plans. Uh, so, uh, excessive handicap accessibility, uh, no fire sprinklers, uh, and I think, uh, I would say, because uh, uh, Mark and I, uh, with the construction side and, and me with uh, working, uh, we do a lot of work with uh, schools, and uh, I would say that uh, you know, it, the goal of the state fire marshal to definitely have uh, K-12 or educational facilities be, uh, be fire sprinkled. And, and, it makes a lot of sense from a safety standpoint, but also uh, when, when you're looking at doing a project, uh, there's, uh, there's a, lot, a lot of leeway that the fire marshal uh, gives us uh, if we are introducing fire sprinklers, uh, that then enables us to save money in other areas uh, because we don't have to uh, kind of do a lot of different, jump through a lot of different hoops in order to be able to do a construction project as we are proposing here tonight. So it really makes, uh, a lot of sense, a lot of good sense to introduce fire sprinklers. Uh, life safety and, and egress issues. Uh, on that there, uh, basically again going back to with, uh, with this building uh, not having fire sprinklers, uh, then you have to have uh, other means of egress available, whether it's through windows or fire escapes, and so there's, uh, there's some issues there with that. So again, going back to the uh, lack of fire sprinklers. Uh, the next one, definitely wanted to highlight uh, the science lab uh, and, and, and it being outdated. I think if you went to probably many of the uh, many of your peer institutions, uh, we've we've done uh, Mark's company and, and mine. Uh, we've we've done a lot of uh, new science labs here in the last uh, in the last few years, and uh, there's definitely. I'm not sure. Maybe that science lab in, uh, in the existing building. Uh, maybe has not been updated perhaps ever. Uh, maybe has had something, but I, uh, I wouldn't know what that would be necessarily. But there's, is there's issues there uh, that can be taken care of and addressed with, uh, with this renovation project. And so, again, I'll, I'll touch on, on that more here in just a little bit. Uh, same thing with some uh, restroom, uh, restroom issues, more so in the, uh, in the 33 building. Um, as opposed to, I mean, these are newer out here, so we're not certainly talking about that. But again, uh, more so on the on the uh, the old building, the original building here. Uh, and then safety and security issues. Um, that's one thing we're we're doing a lot of uh, when basically with any building project uh, now in a, in a K-12 setting uh, is creating a, a secure entrance uh, vestibule to where when you come in uh, from the outside. Uh, you, you're basically forced to go through the office first to check in uh, before you can head on into the school. Uh, so again, I'll touch on that here just in, in a little bit. And then certainly last but not least, as far as uh, items to highlight, would be the kitchen. Uh, again, in the, in the old building, uh, there's, uh, there's some code issues there with that, uh, not to mention. Uh, there is, and certainly uh, your kitchen staff, they do, they do a great job in, in, a, in a small space, outdated space. Uh, have eaten here, it's very good. So, uh, but uh, there are issues there that can certainly be addressed with uh, this project. So, with that, I'm going to uh, head into the concept plans here. I would tell you that uh, if you would like to, if you're not able to see, perhaps on the ends, if you're not able to see, uh, at the end here, we will have uh, a QR code available that you can uh, come up to it with your phone, and it'll take you right to this presentation, and you can. Uh, download the entire presentation from the school's website, uh, and that'll be available here at the uh, conclusion of the presentation. Uh, or maybe you've already uh, downloaded it since we made it first available last uh, last week after the Palisade meeting. So here uh, again, uh, Allison mentioned it, but uh, we're we're just at a conceptual level at this point. Uh, if if Mark wanted to, he could not start building. Well, he maybe could, but he wouldn't get very far. We, 
we're, we're only at a conceptual design level, so we don't have um, we don't have construction drawings or anything like that. It's not it's not shovel ready at this point. Uh, so that's that would be to come here uh, in the next uh, in the next few months here. Uh, so we're at a conceptual level here. So uh, so again, things things could change, and, and there there will be some things that likely uh, likely will change uh, as we would get into that final phase of design. Uh, but this is the concept here that again that we've worked through a, a number of different concepts to arrive at this at this particular solution here that uh, that the board feels uh, would be. Uh, suit would, would be would be best suited for uh, for the school district uh, moving forward as, as far as the Juanita campus is concerned, and so uh, that's the that's the plan that I'm going to highlight here for you tonight. So just just a few things here. Uh, and initially, as we as we started to, to look at uh, possible solutions for this uh, for this campus here, um, I started by looking basically at, at, at any addition. Uh, any addition or additions taking place on the west side of the school, and really, uh, if in, in doing that, with looking at the, the program space that we're looking to add, uh, it, it really consumed a lot of the space there on the west side. Which, um, again, uh, if at some point, if the board uh, would decide to move all of the to bring all of the kids here to this campus. Uh, if we would put a, a pretty su pretty substantial addition on the west side, uh, it really doesn't leave you much uh, much playground space. And certainly, if you're going to have a preschool, uh, you have to have uh, the, the state guidelines mandate. There's mandates as far as the preschool playground, uh, and then certainly you're going to want to have uh, good playground space for the for the younger kids. Uh, but again, going to the west with an addition consumes a lot of that space. So then, if you do that, then the question is where where do you put the where do you put the playgrounds? Do you go across the street to the east? Do you go across the street to the north? Do you take them? Do you have them go up to the football field? Uh, so with that, then we came up with uh, uh, with this option where uh, we would actually put the addition uh, on the east side of the facility. So out this direction here, uh, you already have this addition that was put on in 2010, 2011 of this commons area and lobby. And so, what you see here, this would be all new construction here, again, connecting to uh, the existing gym lobby uh, behind us over here. Uh, so with that, then, uh, we would propose that, uh, that Shawnee Avenue, uh, a one-block section of Shawnee, would be closed, uh, and that would become, uh, uh, most of it would become uh, school property with the street being vacated. Uh, and, and some things, some nice advantages with that uh, would be, uh, so again, the reason being too, and everybody knows this, but uh, Shawnee dead ends, of course, to the north uh, at the football field, basically. And then to the south, uh, it dead ends at the uh, railroad tracks. Uh, so, uh, so, so minimal traffic there moving, uh, moving north-south on Shawnee. Uh, it's not like it's the, the old highway or anything like that. Uh, and then also we have uh, we've had a survey done, uh, so we know uh, we know what uh, what actually is present in terms of utilities uh, running in Shawnee and this block here. And uh, basically, uh, there's, there's one utility, uh, a water line, and uh, we'll be able to address that with the project as far as uh, taking that, taking care of that. So again, with that addition going to the east. Uh, then again, that, that leaves us with ample playground space to the west. Uh, it also then, uh, and again, not that it's, I don't want to make it sound like it's a heavily, uh, heavily trafficked uh, street, but this way too you have uh, most of your campus, because right now you have the parking on the east side over here, uh, so this way it kind of brings all that uh, property, the parking, and the building uh, all together. Uh, and then uh, the nice thing too with this setup is, so if you have a game night or something like that, uh, you can come in right in the middle here. You can, if you're parking on the north side, you come in to the right. That'll take you into this gym where we're at tonight. Or if you go to the left, then that'll go to the uh, to the new practice gym over here, uh, which would also then having that same building would be a new dining space for uh, breakfast and lunch. 
uh, but also be a, an additional gathering space for uh, for games or other events that the district might uh, uh, might host, along with then the new kitchen and some restrooms to uh, uh, to serve that uh, that addition there. As far as with the gym itself, uh, it would be a full uh, a full court, uh, same size as this one here in terms of the main court. Uh, seating would be certainly a lot less than. Uh, then in here, we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 to 200 seats in that ballpark there. But again, it's kind of a final detail decision to be determined uh, when we get into the final design phase. Uh, but again, practice gym with a full court there uh, and then shorter uh, cross courts. Uh, so that's, that's the addition there as proposed. Uh, again, then uh, a, a nice benefit then is that we can uh, with what's left of Shawnee there, we can uh, make that basically a parking lot there uh, on Sundays. Then the, the church can uh, use that, that parking lot there uh, on Sundays. Uh, and then during the week, the school can use that, uh, that uh, parking lot uh, in the form of Shawnee Avenue there. Uh, we are showing uh, a potential pickup and drop-off drive uh, to the south of the main entrance there. Uh, that may or may not happen. We understand this. There's a fair amount of grade change there. You have a, a tunnel that you've built uh, down to the weight room, uh, and so uh, we can we can we can accommodate this, but we may the board may choose to uh, to not do that, perhaps. And so again, that's some of those kind of final final design decisions that'll be made uh, coming up uh, after we get through the, the concept phase here. I'm gonna go move forward here. I did want to mention one thing I forgot to mention. So. Um, with the new construction there, again, the new construction uh, dollars would be coming from the special, uh, the special building fund, which again, uh, the district's been uh, working at saving up uh, for that and also saving up for, uh, to address the uh, facility deficiencies uh, on the existing building uh, as well. So this next slide, uh, and you just need to explain this here a little bit. Uh, so. Again, this is the new addition here, uh, which is then connected to the main, uh, the main level, uh, or this, this level here that we're at tonight here, uh, the main level of the school building. Uh, and then these other, these other plans here, uh, this is the, the second floor of the 33 building. Uh, and then this, this one closest to me here uh, is the, uh, the third floor of the, the 33 building. And uh, so, now as we turn our attention toward the existing building, um, I would point out, so during this, this conceptual phase here, we've been looking at um, possible opportunities for, uh, for bringing uh, wrestling uh, practice uh, into the main building here uh, instead of down the street. Uh, so you can see some, hope I don't trip myself here, but. You can see some wrestling mats that we've just shown as we're studying. Again, this is a study phase here, so uh, I don't want you to think that we are going to turn the turn the band room into a wrestling room or anything like that necessarily. But uh, those are just some different locations where we've studied possible opportunities for for wrestling. So uh, the, the first item I want to highlight with the existing building would be uh, a proposed uh, elevator location. <coughs> Uh, which would be kind of right, right here in the heart of the 33 building. Uh, and in selecting that location there, uh, basically from that location, we can, uh, we can bring accessibility to all of the levels of the 33 building, uh, with the exception of the very lowest uh, point of that, which is the original gym, which is now the weight room there. Uh, Close to this space right here. Uh, so, with that, then what we can do then is from that lowest level outside the kitchen area there, we can uh, we can build a ramp uh, down from that level uh, down into the uh, into the weight room area there. Uh, if that's if that's the if that's the means that, uh, that the board wishes in terms of to make sure that we've got accessibility to uh, essentially every single level that we have here uh, present uh, today. So. Uh, again, at the structural engineer look at that. I think we're, I think we'll be okay to uh, to put the elevator in that location there, uh, and then also want to highlight again uh, the uh, the restrooms. So again, restrooms in the old building 
would be updated, uh, some would be expanded uh, so that we could uh, make them handicap accessible. And then last but not least, uh, again, giving the science lab a complete uh, overhaul to, uh, to bring it up to current standards uh, and uh, bring it in line with what you see at many of, uh, many of the schools that you perhaps compete against or uh, are at the same, uh, same level of competition. And then also kitchen, I mentioned that. So kitchen would move to, uh, to the new addition. Uh, and then where the kitchen is currently, uh, that would be uh, renovated uh, and turned into classroom space. Uh, the current dining room area, that also would be converted into classroom space, instruction space. Uh, and then along with that, there's, you know, this is more of the things that you would see, the more, the more, uh, the more noticeable aspects uh, with, the, with the project. We'd also, uh, there's also some, uh, HVAC issues that I didn't necessarily put on the list here. Those are the things you really don't notice, but you feel. So those would be addressed as well. We could also look at doing some updates to the to the windows um, on parts of the building, uh, and perhaps taking care of some other uh, more smaller or minor issues as well. So that's that kind of uh, summarizes the uh, the proposed uh, work with the uh, existing building. Uh, and a new addition. And uh, this, this slide here just kind of highlighted, this is more for, uh, for BD construction as they have developed uh, the, the cost estimate for the project. So this kind of highlights uh, new construction versus intensive renovation versus, uh, versus light renovation. So that's kind of the purpose of that slide there. Here are some conceptual renderings that, uh, that we put together. Uh, and we will also, as we continue further along the process here, we will develop additional renderings. Uh, and the nice thing is, so uh, we're able to, in our final design phase, uh, we're able to actually uh, take the board, these are part of the design committee, take them through the space uh, in 3D so you get a chance to see, uh, see the space before you actually, before BD would actually return any, uh, any dirt. So, Again, just a conceptual view here. This would be from the uh, from the north side of the of the school, uh, looking uh, towards the building. This would be on the south side, uh, looking back towards the building. Uh, so you can see the addition there in the background. Uh, I didn't mention earlier, but there would be a small uh, addition at the current main entrance there to to again provide a, a secure uh, entrance there at the main entrance. And then you can see the, uh, the church building off to the right. So again, uh, estimated project cost, which excuse me, which BD has compiled. Uh, we're looking at uh, a range of uh, eight to eight and a half million, uh, and that would be all in. So that would include uh, contingency and uh, design engineering cost uh, and some other soft costs as well. But uh, that's what uh, that's where the estimate. Um, has come in at, again, eight, eight to eight and a half a million. Uh, and from here, I'm going to turn it over to First National Capital Markets, uh, and they'll talk about uh, the financial aspects of the project. And when we get further on the presentation here, we do have um, some frequently asked questions that uh, Alice and I will run through that uh, coming up here after uh, First National Capital Markets. So Carl Dietz from First National Capital Markets is here. Well, can everybody hear okay down there? Can you hear? Okay. I'm hard of hearing, so uh, I was even having a couple hearing people. Okay. That's our time. I'm looking at, sitting down here, I'm looking at all the state championships that you've won, and I think I counted six one act or state speech championships, um, and then the all, all sports, all, they're all um, the all class NSA Cup championship. Meaning that covers all the sports, all the activities. And then the one that really stands out is the Sportsmanship Award. Same year you were state champions, you won the Sportsmanship Award, and then you were in Sportsmanship when you were runner up. Those things are hard to get, and that's very impressive. I didn't realize, Randy, that you had had that many state championships. You've got a lot to be proud of. I, I've been in a lot of schools, I've never had that many state championships, so that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, yeah, as Jacob said, I'm Carl Dietz. Um, 
Started teaching at Finkelman, Nebraska in 1981. Finished out the school year there and then uh, started teaching in Wood River. Um, was there 16 years, got into administration. I was a superintendent at Eustis Farnham School. I lived in Gothenburg until my freshman year. Um, moved to uh, Farnham, so graduated from Farnham. And then I went back and I was superintendent at Eustis Farnham. While I was in Eustis Farnham for four years, we were faced with levy overrides, having to make cuts. I closed, well, I was a superintendent uh, when we closed the Farnham building. So the school that I graduated from, we had to close the building. Similar to what has been discussed, not that you're closing any buildings right now, I don't want to put any words in anybody's mouth, but I know it's difficult, it's not easy. Um, just to, you know, I, I come from small schools, I'm a superintendent in Ogallala, we passed a bond issue, we closed three buildings, consolidated every, uh, into one, and we ended up having a K-8 building and a 712 building. We used to have a kindergarten, a 1-2, a 3-5, a 6-8, and a 9-12, and a gymnasium separate, for those of you that have uh, been in Ogallala. But we closed some of those elementary buildings and went to a K-8 building. But I just want you to know, I, I take pride in coming from small schools. I, I know how important our small schools are to us, but sometimes boards of education are faced with difficult decisions. So um, I am the guy from Kearney, Nebraska, coming in here and trying to give you some financial information. But I know some of the decisions that the board is faced with and, and also some of the community members are faced with. I, I've heard a lot of the stories that um, some of the people have shared. Uh, what does it do to the town if, if, if it's closed? Those are legitimate questions. And um, if, if you want you know, to answer some of those questions when we're all done, I can talk about some of those things. But Jacob, go ahead and go to the next slide. So currently, and there are several of these slides that go together, but currently, the cash equity that you have, there's $3 million in the general fund and depreciation fund to put towards this project, and 1.5 currently that you can use towards this uh, new project in the special building fund. This is kind of giving you a historical uh, bar chart of where the district was with three primary funds. Now the district operates more than just these funds, but these are the ones that you can use towards renovation, updates, uh, new construction, those sort of things. But as you can see, these are the cash balance of all three. And the school district started putting money aside several years ago because they knew they had to do something. Facilities are getting run down. At some point in time in the future, we're going to have to do something. We don't know what it is yet, but let's start saving money rather than having to pay a lot of interest later on. And so the Board of Education administration did a good job of planning for the future. Go ahead, Jacob. Uh, this one's yours. Yep. So, uh, Carl introduced himself, so I'll, I'll go ahead and, and do an introduction for myself. I'm, I'm Matt Fisher. Um, I'm also working with First National Capital Market. Um, I did some of the work that, that Carl's done in terms of really looking at your overall finances, but that's been primarily Carl's role. Most of my role has been more on the side of, of looking at what could you do with some, some different finance tools. And, you know, again, Carl gave a little bit of background on himself. And, and as I look through this crowd, I recognize a few people here because I spent 14 years of my career in education in Imperial um, as a high school principal there and then as a superintendent at, at Chase County School. So I've actually spent quite a bit of time in this gym. Um, I always was, was really uh, impressed with uh, the things that that Juanita Palisade was able to do, you know, certainly from an activity standpoint. Um, and then as, as I had the chance to work with, uh, you know, different administrators from, from Juanita Palisade uh, as far as what, what you had going on academically as well. So certainly a, a good, strong uh, educational program. And, and obviously in, in small schools, as, as Allison alluded to before, you're, you're a very critical part of the community. And when you want students to come back to your community, uh, the best thing that you can do is make sure that they have a really good experience 
while they're in school so that they have that desire to come back and have their kids have that same kind of experience. So I, I, I certainly think that having that idea of investing in your community through investing in your schools is, is very valid. Um, and so as, as you think about you know, the process that the board is, is going through right now, they've been saving money, just like Carl talked about. They've saved up about $4.5 million to invest in facilities and, and make a project happen. Well, 4.5 is only a part of the 8.5 that, that Jacob talked about in terms of the overall cost of the project. So the other thing that First National Capital Markets has been doing is working with the, the district to try and identify, well, what would be some of the ways that you could come up with those other dollars? And obviously, you could run a bond and go to a vote of the people and ask to put in place a 20-year bond that would come up with that other $4 million. Uh, so that's, that's certainly been one of the, the points of consideration. Um, and I think everyone kind of understands that and, and understands certainly there's uh, uh, a tax impact that goes along with that. Well, what we wanted to focus on is a couple of other ways that the, the district would be able to put those additional dollars in place um, and really do it in a more physically responsible way, actually cost the taxpayers less. And so, as you look at what we've got up here, um, in terms of that financing, a $3 million lease purchase would be something that the, the district could do. Um, and the way the, the lease purchase process works is, you can do a lease purchase for up to seven years, and it has to be paid through your special building fund. Well, your special building fund has a tax limit of 14 cents. So the most you can tax for in your building fund is 14 cents. So within that set of limitations, the district would be able to do $3 million through a lease purchase. Now obviously, the, one of the real benefits of a lease purchase, as opposed to a long-term bond, is it's paid off in seven years. You're going to pay considerably less in interest because it's short-term interest which has a much lower rate and you're not paying it for nearly as long. So just about anything else that you finance you know that you know the shorter your rate uh, in terms of the years that you're going to pay something back the less you're going to pay actually. Then the other piece that would get you to the 8.5 million when you combine it to, with the 4.5 that's already there would be QC Puff bonding. Now, QC Puff is one of those acronyms that stands for Qualified Capital Purpose Undertaking Fund. So it has to qualify. So there's only certain things that qualify for this kind of funding. And in this case, because you are dealing with things like school safety and handicapped accessibility, um, those are things that would qualify the sprinkler system, renovating restrooms, a new secure entrance. Those would all be things that could be paid for through a qualified capital purpose undertaking bond. Now, there are some limitations on those bonds as well. Uh, basically, they can only be a maximum of 10 years, and the most that you can levy for with that qualified capital purpose undertaking bond is three cents. And so it, it has some limitations, but within those limitations, the district would be able to do a million dollars. So between those two finance instruments, the, the district could put together the other four million dollars that they would need to do this project now. And Jacobs will go ahead and go to the next slide. Some of the reasons why you maybe would want to do that now, as opposed to continuing to save, which would be another option. Obviously, the district has saved up 4.5 million. They could continue to save, but again, there are costs that are associated with saving and eventually doing it once the, the dollars were in place. 
And as you look at this, um, you know, obviously that, that equity that they already have is a great thing because it's going to save somewhere between $400,000 and $600,000 in interest because the dollars are already there. So that's a great thing. But if you think about waiting, and you think about construction costs moving upwards at a three to five percent rate annually, and you see how this project with an eight million dollar price tag pretty soon is, is 10 million or maybe 12 million by the time you get the dollars saved up to do it, obviously there's, there's costs associated with that. The other thing is, although interest rates have moved since the first of the year, we're still in a very favorable interest in terms of bonds environment. And if you think about a 1% move upward in interest rates being equal to another 500000 in interest that the district would have to pay, then you can see why thinking about using some of these financing instruments and getting the project done now has some financial benefits. Then obviously the other benefit is is that it's done now rather than done eight years or ten years from now because with the district's levying ability at 14 cents in the building fund you could put in about 500,000 a year so if you think about 500,000 a year to get that that next four million that's needed that's eight years and in eight years it's not going to be four million that they need it's probably going to be six or seven or eight million. So again, you start chasing a number at some point in time, and it just becomes more financially prudent to do something now rather than later. So with that, Carl's going to tell you a little bit more about that last bullet point there, which basically said that the financing for this could basically be done within the same taxing parameters that, that are in place right now or have been in place in the last few years. So going back to 2010, 2011, this is the levy that the uh, landowners have paid within this district, 1011, anywhere from 95 cents, it was up to a buck six at one time, and currently 21.22 for all funds, you're 99 cents. Now I know the levy and, and if your valuation goes up, you're actually receiving more money to go ahead. So this is the money that has been generated at those levies. And as you can see at one time, it was 2 million, 2, 4, 2, 8, and a high point of $4.2 million. Currently, the district's taxing for $3.8 million. Now, go back one more time, Jacob. Here. So there was an increase here. And there's a reason for that other than just spending. So the next one. This is what's happened to your state aid. At one time, you were getting 900 and some thousand dollars of state aid, and like most, if not all, rural districts, the state aid formula changed, and you're basically, all you're collecting is income tax rebate money. You are not an equalized school district. So to offset that loss in state aid, that's what the district had to do, was increase the taxation to maintain a good cash balance, but also plan for some facility upgrades in the future. This is the general fund spending pattern since 2009, 2010. And if you take from this year to 2021, your audited numbers, basically, you're looking at about 2.6% growth in, in spending, which is very conservative in my estimation compared to a lot of school districts. So it's not like the district is taxing and spending a lot of money on things that maybe aren't necessary, but some people might think in their mind they're spending on things that are not necessary. But really, it, it's been um, very gradual, and not even a, a huge increase. There were some peaks and valleys here, but not huge peaks and valleys. As uh, Matt and I work with other school districts, you see huge increases. We keep talking about efficiencies, <clears throat> and if you're in one facility, you know, I, I, I used to Farnham, we saved money. We save staff time on the road. We save money in our school nutrition fund. Ogallala, same thing. By closing some buildings, consolidating, you're going to be more efficient with your money, but also with educational time or teacher's time. 
So between Jacob and I, we came up with a few what we thought might be frequently asked questions. And the number one is the biggest elephant in the room. What would it cost if we were to rebuild our Palisade facility, making sure we have enough rooms, um, new kitchen, library, the resource ah. rooms that we need. And this is an estimate, and anything you've read in our minutes also listed an estimate. And Mark, I'll turn this over to you after I answer, but it's between 8.7 and $9 million. And that's just the elementary building that would not touch our current gym that we have today. There are some updates that need to happen to that gym as well, and that would be roughly speaking around $500,000. So with that said, that $500,000 could come out of our general fund because that's renovating current existing space. <coughs> Putting up a new facility in Palisade would require us to run a bond issue because we are not financially set up to fund that through the tools that we have today. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, and nobody asked this question, but I want to share this because I did ask this question. What if we did have to buy, pass a bond issue? What if it passed? Because we want to do some great things in Palisade. What would that look like to our taxes? That's an extra 20 cents on top of what our levy already is today. So if we're at 99, that's going to put you at 119. So, just to give you a perspective on what that looks like, because that bond issue would be good for 20 years, um, and we would have 20 years to repay that, and that's a different instrument that we could use. But I wanted to share that, because I asked that question. What would that look like to my taxes? Because I think you all want to ask that question too, so I did. And I didn't know what that figure was. So, do you want to talk to us about how you came up with these current estimates, yeah. please? Um, Jacob put together a quick program of around 22,000 square feet, which would include an admin area, a uh, full service kitchen, pre K through fifth, uh, some spare rooms, library, commons, some additional restrooms, and we use some comp numbers uh, based on some current projects that we've done. So that's how we can help it. Um, next question. What if we just were able to fix up the current building that's in Palisade today? Well, it's 98 years old. Um, structurally, I think it's outlived its life, um, but it's still standing and we're very thankful for that. Um, some things too, I didn't share earlier, but uh, addressing our ADA accessibility issues, today we have two students in our elementary level that have to use what I call the robot that goes up and down the stairs. And it transports them up, to their classrooms um, as those individuals you know age and move up in the building i said will that robot be able to make the corner go up two more flights of stairs to get to the top floor at palisade and the answer is yes it will um, so i asked could we bring that same thing here because some of those students will obviously be coming to our building at some point um, yes we could bring it here but how our stairwells are set up today that apparatus would not be able to make the corners. So there would not be enough maneuvering room for that. Plus we've got students in and out of those hallways or stairwells, um, so it would require just a little bit of time. Um, and so that's another thing too, and we talked about all of our great things that we do on the activity side. Many of our students become injured for some reason. They blow a knee, an ankle, whatever that looks like. Many of our students spend a good, those injured students spend a good portion of their day sitting in the office because they can't maneuver stairs. And so we're taking away from their educational experience, instruction time with teachers, and just collaboration time with their students. So that's another great thing why we want to make this um, an accessible spot too. So then they're not having to miss that time. Because recently I was in the office and a student was there after he had rehab from his knee and I said, are you bored? He said, yes I am, I miss my teachers and I miss my students. So those are some things too that I think we want to give a quality education when we need any kid, regardless of any disability or at this point in time injury, the ability to go to the classroom. So um, to answer that note, we, at this point in time we can't fix up what we have today. Okay, so that was also a question. 
Um, why do we need another gym? Um, well, as Jacob and I were talking about this, this I believe was built in the 50s, and some of you probably remember that for sure. I wasn't here yet. Um, but at that point in time, we only had male sports. So we only needed one gym because we didn't have female sports. And now we have, you know, Title IX that allows us that we have to provide the same opportunities for our female students that we do for our male students. So also today, our junior high uses this gym split in half to practice. It is not a full court for both of them. And so when we go to compete, we are definitely at a disadvantage. And therefore, if we were to have a second gym, we could free up some scheduling things too. Because in this facility, we offer sixth through 12th grade. So our sixth graders today utilize this gym for their PE. And so that would allow, in the event someday, if we needed to move everyone here, we would have that flexibility with another gym to allow greater flexibility in our scheduling of those daily things that need to happen. Also, our youth sports have really increased within the last 15 years. So we are also having our youth teams that are competing for every gym that we have in the district. They compete for this one, they compete for the one in Palisade, and that would allow us another avenue for that. And I've had a lot of people say, we really talk a lot about sports here. Well, one thing that we have learned serving on this board is having a sports program can be a huge motivator for our students in the classroom because they have to keep their grades up in order to have the ability to play. And I heard parents last week say, had we not had the opportunity for our students, and that includes other activities as well, not just sports, my child might have not made it through school. But that was a motivator for them to go to class, get their work done, and graduate. And many of them, I'm sure, have returned. I mean, I've not heard, but I would imagine a lot of you have returned. And today, probably education is a little more important now that you've gone through that. But I will say, too, I am proud to see that our students work really hard in the classroom. And I would love to see us have another opportunity. It also makes us more competitive. So we travel an awful long ways because we're in the Class D2 land. If we had the opportunity to have two gyms, we could potentially play both of our JV games at the same time and allow people to return home earlier. Those of you, when you have freshmen, you start at that JV first game and you're there till that varsity game. It can be a four to a five hour night. So I just wanted to share that with you. Also, Jacob shared too, for those of you that traveled to um, Diller Odell, when we played, when we played Diller Odell at Wilcox Ultra, they also are class D2, both of those schools, and they also operate at their um, junior high and high school facility that's together, two gyms. And so again, it just, it makes us more competitive. It makes us align with our peers, and I think that that's really important. So um, that's something we thought could really benefit. Also, early morning practices, because our coaches love this wood floor, they don't love our sport court, but it does fit what we need it for. They will fight for this gym. So our children sometimes are on the road at 5 a.m. in the morning to make it for practice, or if they're staying later after the after school practice. So it might not be 8.30 or 9 o'clock before they return home, and they still have studies to complete and get done. So I just, safety is huge. We talk about student safety, and that's another piece of it. We drive a lot of miles, but we also choose to live where we choose to live. So anything else I can add, or do you want to add? No. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, we talk about. Uh, why do we need a secure entry? I did touch on this uh, some in the earlier part of the presentation, but again, uh, safety and security of the students and staff are uh, the district's, uh, well, if not the number one priority right up there with, uh, uh, with the educating of, of the students. And uh, so there's more than just active shooter situations, too. And, um, having a secure uh, having a secure entrance uh, will help with some other uh, some other aspects too of different uh, whether it's uh, parents coming to, to visit their child or something like that. Um, again, it takes care of a lot of different uh, situations and just help keep the, the school more uh, more secure. And again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's it's really become the norm. Any any project where we're uh, doing anything at all with the building. Uh, this is something that we're taking care of and addressing. Uh, I don't know. It's 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 probably uh, you know, everybody everybody knows how, how safe uh, Juanita and Palisade are, but 
But you never know, and again, it takes care of more than just uh, active shooter situations. No, but we have had situations where there have been shooters in the community and we haven't been able to have school. Um, and we've been very blessed that we haven't had an active shooter situation within our school, but we also know that we do it from time to time have disgruntled employees, or uh, not employees, parents. Um, and maybe there's some things happening within the courts and they, you know, maybe there are some restrictions there that would allow that extra safety because that is a, a real possibility. So. I think I touched on this one uh, earlier. Again, why do we need a new cafeteria and kitchen? Um, touched on that earlier, but uh, code issues uh, and it's, uh, it's small, certainly compared to uh, today's standards. But again, you're doing uh, you're doing uh, you're doing great things out of that uh, uh, small and outdated kitchen. But again, it's something that can be addressed, and the district's been saving money uh, to address those issues. And some of the things too, even like going down. Uh, some some steps to, to bring to make food delivery and all that that will all be taken care of of course with uh, with the project so you can uh, load on the same level as the as the kitchen. Oh, so how does this project uh, impact our students? Number one, it improves their safety and their security. We also will be allowed to have a fully accessible building other than our lower uh, weight room, but we do have the ability to take them outside. But it sounds like if this goes through, we have an ability to do something within too. But I'm really excited to see that accessibility piece because those students love to learn just as everybody else. Um, a modern science lab. Um, I've subbed in that classroom and that lab is very much outdated. And I don't think this is the first time we've heard this, but it's the first time we really want to address it. Um, we have some great people within our district that science is huge and a super important part. It is one of the core subjects that we learn about. I would love to see an opportunity to update that. Plus we know we've got some other code issues there that that would uh, take care of. Um, improving our restrooms. Um, we have a lot of work to do in that area, I will say. But again, our students don't complain. Our staff doesn't complain. And I, I want to commend all of you that work for the district. And you don't come to us complaining about our restroom is tiny. We have cloth doors because we don't have a metal door. Uh, things like that. So again, I feel like everyone has done a great job of living every day in the facilities that we have. But we have an opportunity to do some improving. Um, better HVAC. There isn't anybody in this room that hasn't said how hot this gym can get, right? So. We have also done a great job of buying all PTAC units for all of our classrooms at both locations. And so that provides some relief, but we have an aging boiler here. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, so our third floor classrooms are 50 degrees. Sometimes it's working really well and it's 105 degrees. So it can go you know, from one extreme to the other. The PTACs do help, especially I think in the fall and in the spring, maybe not so much in the winter, but that was how we addressed so we didn't have to have early releases anymore because the heat was so hot. But this would give an opportunity. Most of us live in houses today where we do have an HVAC system, so we should be able to provide that for our kids. Um, and then we talked about increasing our gym space opportunities. Um, again, that goes without saying. Our youth sports continue down at the kindergarten level, and then we go all the way through high school. So we have an opportunity there to make it more accessible, allow our student athletes the opportunities you know that other student athletes have. So. Sure. Why now? Isn't this a bad time to, to do a project? Uh, well. I, Everybody knows there's no perfect time to, uh, to do a project, but as, uh, as Matt uh, mentioned earlier, uh, interest rates are, are, are still still good. Um, they're likely gonna, gonna be going up, but uh, for the time being, they're still, they're still good. Uh, and, and really, the, the, the board uh, has been proactive about this. I mean, in terms of saving up money to address these issues versus uh, versus being reactive and just dealing with things as they break down or fall apart uh, or whatever may be the case. So uh, now, now is now is a good time to uh, to do uh, this project. Did you want to? No. 
but as we've looked at the projects, it's amazing to us. When we first started talking about this in 2021, I would say on average, when, when we're looking at costs, and Mark, I will turn this over to you and talk a little bit about it, but our costs are rising. To get our supplies here to do something, on average is going up about a percent a month, roughly speaking. And so that's crazy. We have supply needs, demands. I'm gonna turn that over and let Mark talk about it, but that's really why, because all of us know, you wish you would have. You wish that we would have done this in 06. We wouldn't be here today talking about this project and the fact that we have another facility that needs some major attention. So I just would say, you never wish that you would have until you're at this point today. And I really wish that we would have started moving forward and doing some things back in 06, even in 2017. So Mark, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I've been looking at cost options out here on different things over the years, even back when Mr. Ison was here. He had brought me in and you were looking at the facility and the board then was looking at options. And how we do that, our, our role is as the options the board wants to look at, the scope that Jacob puts together, it's our role to put costs on it. We actually do a pretty comprehensive cost analysis on each option. We actually go in by construction category and put in light items based on the information that we're seeing in the market. Um, we recently just did uh, Elm Creek School just like a couple weeks ago. Uh, Dodge Hall School, Stapleton School, St. Cecilia Schools, uh, KPS did an Aram Center that Jacob and I did worked on together. We're working on Hershey right now. Um, so we've been doing this a long time. And so that's been our role throughout this process. So. <laughs> So we would talk about our next steps. Um, this was from last week, so we didn't change any of our slides, so hi, we're at the first step. Um, we will move into our final design and engineering phase, and that's a five to a six month process, um, because that's just how that works. Um, and then we could potentially begin construction on the east side of our building, late fall into the winter. That would not disrupt our students at all, because they don't have to be in their current existing um, facility. And then we would have that complete um, probably, what do you think? The final winter? I don't know, I'm asking. Um, and then oh. would allow us, so we were calling the new construction as our phase one. We're only calling it phase two for the reno just to give you an idea of the only time we could get in and actually renovate the facility would be when our students aren't in session. So we would be looking at mid-May through mid-August, maybe very end of August. So there's a short window there that the renovation teams could come in and begin their work. So um, I did have somebody ask last week and I wanted to share this. So if you look where our current kitchen is today with the eating facility, um, we could potentially add three classrooms there. Today in this facility, we have probably two classrooms that aren't fully utilized to their full potential. Um, so those two with those three, that's five classrooms. Um, in the event that we look to really think about moving all the students here, I wanted to give you an idea of how could we accommodate all of those students. We're trying to look at that right now, but we have the ability to go ahead and renovate some of the space and provide that for the district. Um, we don't, at this point in time, have any formal decision made at all. We haven't said we are closing a facility. We haven't inked any deals to start construction. But I will tell you, as your board, we would like to move forward with something because we, for 22 years, have not done anything as this has been in discussion. So, okay, what else? So as a thank you, here is just a conceptual design. When it's over, if you'd like to come up, um, this whole entire presentation is already on our website. For those of you um, that want to know, if you go to, you need to use a computer. I've tried it with my phone. I can't get there with my phone. So you need to use your computer. Go to oneatapalisade.org, oneatapalisadeschools.org, right? And then under district info, go down to school board info, and there's a link there for this whole entire uh, project. So before I open it up for questions, Comments from our public? <coughs> the board, do you 
have anything that you would like to share? Well, like, like Allison said, we have talked about this for a number of years, and um, we haven't decided exactly which, how this project is going to go forward, but we have decided as a board that we need to address the housing building, that the building itself is not um, not structurally sound enough to, to renovate, to put more money into, and it, it's a fragile old building, so what is down the road? What is in the near future that we're going to have to we're going to have to sink a lot of money into that building that um, we possibly use as a new facility down there, or or go to a purpose that would last? Um, so that uh, even though we haven't made a final decision how we're going to go forward for that, we have decided to really address that issue. We have, we need to address that. Else? I'd just like to put in, I'm very proud of our school. I believe we have an excellent school system. They talked about growing your own and having students come back. Um, right at a little over half of our staff members are graduates from our school. So I think that speaks volumes of, uh, you know, how people want to come back and live in this district and uh, live in southwest Nebraska in this area. Also, a lot of our people that are employed now, a lot of our employees, period, are graduates, but also a lot of our teachers grew up within a 45-mile radius. I think I counted six or seven. I was one of them. Six or seven of us grew up in this radius. I'm very proud of our teachers and our, our graduates want to come back and serve this school district. I think that speaks volumes. Um, we will allow a 30-minute question, comment, opportunity and after that we will close that but please know any of us are here after that 30 minutes to answer questions um, to visit with you we aren't not accessible we are accessible so um, I will now open it up um, to our patrons and guests can this be done by a vote of the board or does it have to be a vote of the people this could be done with the vote of the board. Okay. Yes. I have a, have a statement and a question. First of all, it appears to me that you've already made up your mind. We're going to close policy for everybody up here. So my question is, maybe instead of a new gym, where are you going to put these kids? Are you going to add classrooms? Because you're going to come up with three classrooms, uh, the cafeteria and the kitchen. That's not enough for all those kids you've got up there in Palisade. You're going to have to add some classrooms. And I think maybe you should add some classrooms to educate the kids instead of building a new gym across the street. That's what I think about it. We do have additional classrooms already in our facility that we aren't using at its full potential. So it would allow for two more classrooms. So that would be five. Yes. You can hold all the kids in Palisade up there. There's an opportunity for us to really look at that, I believe, and really put our pencils <coughs> and paper together. Um, yes, I do think there's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think the money needs to be spent on the education instead of the gymnasium. Okay. How long is it before we can borrow and So basically, if you would, you know, if the board would decide to go that direction, then you know the the QC Puff, if they if they borrow the million dollars for ten years, and pretty much with your valuation where it's at right now, it would take most of the three cents to pay that off. So pretty much that avenue would be locked for 10 years. Uh, the lease purchase, uh, it would not take the full 14 cents to, uh, to fund the, the three million that we talked about doing there. And that would be for seven years. So most of your ability to borrow as a lease purchase would be tied up for seven years. You would have a little bit, you'd have a little bit. 
some things in terms of, of those two avenues. Yeah, I mean, it's not enough to add an additional what we need to, to bring all the kids from Palisade home. It's close. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if we can't do that, then what's, what's our choice for Palisade? We're going to maintain that school for another seven years in a minute. What are we doing there to address the safety issues that are there? Because if there's only going to be five classrooms here available, if you count, there's seven grades in Palisade. So I know you guys said that, you know, to fit everybody comfortably, get your pencil paper, all that out, I, I understand that. But if this project right now is not set in stone to move anybody over, what is going to be done to maintain the Palisade building until we can utilize new funds or more funds to bring everybody comfortably over here. Because that could be seven to 10 years. And the way we understand it is that building is, I mean, we are nursing along, limping it along. The gym's not, the gym room isn't in great shape. There's stuff, you know, maintenance stuff that could be taken care of in Cal State School. Like, what's going to happen if, to that Cal State School in the meantime, until everybody can get moved over here comfortably? I think that we have we have two options. Um, reasonably, we have two options. We have bring everybody here, you know, maintain this building to fit everybody, or we have build a new elementary school in Palisade. And um, uh, if if um, if building a new elementary school in Palisade is the option that we go down, if you know if we can get a bond issue passed. That, that, that's a valid, good option. You know, having a separate elementary has its benefits, and doing that would be fine. But as far as if we didn't do a single thing in Juanita, we couldn't use that 8.5 to build that school. And we couldn't do it for the three million that we have in the lease purchase. It would take more money than that. So we, there would be no other option than on to do that. So if we can get some, some you know, support and some real momentum behind a bond, then th that's a valid option. We have not counted that out. And we would do that. We, we would definitely need some, you know, people people behind us and people kind of campaigning for us to get that done, to get that project done. At the last meeting, you guys were very proud of the school. We haven't had a bond in 50 years. So I'm, I'm guessing, I mean, I don't have a farm ground. I mean, I have some house in policy. So I mean, I know that would put a lot of financial strain if we did this bond and up to everybody's taxes and all that. But it takes a little bit to get the bond going. And if we don't have people on board, so let's throw the bond out the window. Not an option. What is going to be done? So the policy is still going to be clean it until everybody can get over here separately. If there's only going to be five classrooms available, there are seven in policy. Unless you're going to start combining kindergarten together or doing something like that. Like that's, I think that's what was asked at the last meeting. And it got interrupted by other questions and then just kind of got pushed by the way. Like, that is my biggest concern. I mean, I am not against renovating and updating. I mean, my kids are sports, all athletic, but they are 100% academic as well. So I understand the need for the renovation. And I'm not against it at all. I just want to know until everybody can get here comfortably, what is going to be done to keep the policy school functioning? Sam, we got to start somewhere, and the full time on this board, um, the elevator, the HVAC system, the electrical of both buildings, and the direction we're going with this building right now is more feasible. And some options to get everybody here that we've discussed, but not on paper, because uh, we're, we're dealing with a budget that we can do, but there's some space above the weigh room. That we could put a second level in there, and that would be a very large classroom that would be somewhat inexpensive. Wouldn't be new construction, but it would it would double that area there. The library right now is huge, and libraries are kind of out of date. Everybody goes to computer rooms and things like that. So that would be something you could take a smaller room and make a library out of to open up the possibility of bigger classrooms there. But in the end, this is just a direction that I feel comfortable with to get one side safe and handicapped and up to date that we can afford with the possibility of like 22 years ago when all this started and nothing's happened until now, 
I feel like we've got to do something to at least the board six years from now will have a facility that is up to date and they have the option to, if they can afford it at that time, to add a couple classrooms over there and, and make that a west wing of elementary, something like that. And the band-aids only cost the money. I mean, we can plaster, we can paint and do things, but when it gets down to that structure, those walls are, you know, they are what it is. Why does the safety of the kids come down to this new gym here? And I mean, walking around, and I appreciate you guys open Palisade, I appreciate you open wanting us to look around, because I have not gone to either one school. And I come over here, and I can obviously see where all the dollars have gone. I mean, this school is nice. I mean, you guys got nice classrooms, you got nice restrooms. I mean, I'm not saying Palisade's bad. I don't feel unsafe in Palisade. I don't feel bad sending my daughter there. But I mean, Palisade has no pride of ownership. Nothing's been cleaned up. There's stuff shoved in closets. The classrooms look like it's just a menagerie of stuff. And you come here and there's desks and, I mean, rooms are clean. There's not all I don't think closets. my classroom in Palisade is a menagerie of stuff, and so I don't really support the comment. And I do take pride in my classroom in Palisade, so that's... I'm, I'm not being an teacher. Attention drawn to it here with all this 
sprinklers and everything, can that be started now or do we have to wait till we decide what to do with that as to go forward? It can be started now. Yes. Brenda. I have concerns about uh, being diversified enough if we move everybody up here. I think we can pull some people from the east and trying to be center that whole area and brought it up in the meetings that there's low population, we need every student we can get. And I think it's a valid concern because your board came to our board when we first went together, saying that they didn't want to ever go to Imperial. So I feel like we need to nurture both towns and make sure that we grow. And we're not going to save a lot by moving it up here, in my opinion. The busing is going to be the same. We're going to have 96 kids that are from Palisade that are going to have to be bus. That's more than one show. That's not going to change. We still have the country kids. That's not going to change. There'll be some things maybe we can do, but sometimes there's, when you're in a business, as you put a plan it as a business, sometimes you have to spend a little extra in one area to nurture it to make sure that we stay strong all the way across. And I'd really like to have everybody consider that. I appreciate that comment. Yes, TJ. Mine kind of goes along with Brenda's. I think we need to look at it as we have a low population and I think if we look at it from the valley, Hay Center is going kind of down and I think if we do more of a merge type thing and talk to them, if we build a school somewhere else, and get it in center to help us build a bigger school somewhere other than here. We could get a center, we could get some of Trenton, and we could get the funding, more of funding. A center only has one school in that county, and they can help us build a bigger school. They need help. Those parents ain't going to want their kids to drive back country to Maywood. That is what they don't want. And they are needing help. So we need to help them consolidate. So I think we just need to look at it from another point of view and do that instead of doing it over here because we're just in the years to come. You guys are just going to go away and everybody's just going to die out after a while. Yes, Bob. Two things. I graduated here in 92, first year of Cal State together was 91. Uh, I mean, we went through all school here, elementary all the way, kindergarten all the way up. We did it in the school. Um, so there, there's room, there's room in here for everybody. I know there's more computer rooms, things have been taken away. There's room in here for everybody. With that, more additions. And second of all, we're talking about, you know, kids busing. I know there's kids on the North Divide, they're from the far end, that have to ride all the way here and go to Palisade. So it's a, it's a whole issue, one way or the other. Second of all, we lost. There's people on the, that are west of us here. The same reason why people on the far end of the district, the other way towards Trenton, that wouldn't want to bring kids, have them ride the bus all the way here. We've lost people from the west that don't want to bring their kids here because they didn't want to have to bus them all that way. So I think it's you know, we're we're fighting two battles against different deals. There's there's kids that want to come this way, kids that probably maybe don't want to come this way because they got they ride buses. So somebody's got to ride a bus. One way or the other. So we got a big enough school for everybody. Other comments? Over here now. Oh. Yeah, I have a statement and kind of a two part question. So I kind of get the upset of the new gym and where that kind of is causing some fire for people, but 
with that conceptual plan, if you're putting K-12 in here, you're taking away the palisades, you have to have two gyms. Otherwise, where do you want those kids to have PE class? Um, so that's just kind of a statement of what I understand. So correct me if I'm wrong on that. My two-part question is, if we do a bond issue and we build a whole new elementary school in Palisade, what's the timeline on getting the students out of the outdated building and into their new elementary school? Versus if we do the building here all in one in Juanita, what's the timeline of getting every student out of the old unsafe building? Which one gets the students out of the unsafe building faster, going to bond issue to Palisade or all students here? Because it kind of sounds like your hands are tied, that students have to be removed from that current building. We either have to build a new one or have to add on to this building. One of the two that can't renovate and stay in the current building, correct? Correct. So to answer her question regarding the bond piece is, we would definitely, as your board, if that's the direction that we hear all of you want to do, we would definitely look at all of those things. We would have to get a more solid number from our design team so that we would know what it is we're actually asking. And then from there, there are certain rules when it comes to putting it on your go to the public during your different elections. I think something to like the month before we can't ask or the month after, correct? From an election time frame? In an election year. In, in an election year. So this is an election year. So we couldn't do it in April. We couldn't do it in June. We couldn't do it in October. We couldn't do it in December. Um, and with that, it would take the vote of the entire public. So all of you would have a say in that. So I'm going to say, I don't know that we can have a number ready, even in December, to say this is what it's going to take. And we're ready to take that to the public to have a mail. Because that's what it would be. It would so be a 2023 vote. It would be a 2023 vote, vote instead for of sure. if it get passed. Yeah, if it got passed. What yeah. would be the timeline if we added on and, and did the renovation here, what is the estimated timeline to get all the students out of Palisade? It out could, of the current building, I should say. It could potentially be two to three years. Yep. By the time everything will be finished. Yeah. That's to move everyone. That's not leaving any students behind or consolidating. Mm -hmm. That's every student out of an unsafe building in two to three years. Yeah. Yeah. And then the bottom we are still in the same boat we are today. Did it start over? <clears throat> no. Yep. Nick, you had a question. You've been standing and waiting patiently. Yes, I have a question about the inflation. Can you speak up, please? I'm sorry. I have a question about the inflation that we have that we're facing raging inflation. I know it was talked about 1% or something like that between now and the time this thing is finished talked about that possibly we can't get some building materials for eight months to a year. How do you address the inflation factor in materials and labor over the, the length of this project, the eight and a half months, what I'm referring to, or any project as far as that goes? Yeah, it's got, difficult. Ed's already said inflation is going to be, uh, going to raise rates four to five times this year, but probably the same next year. How can you come up with a fairly decent number that addresses those things? It's not fun. Um, we actually watch studies of inflation. I know in 2020, during the pandemic, we saw a 16% inflation rate in school construction. Um, we're seeing a little bit less than that in 2021, not much. And so we're trying to prognosticate this by when we're doing the construction. We're, we're kind of anticipating that we'll, we'll level out some. You know, we won't see the double digit. But this, you brought another question too. Of the availability of material actually dictates our schedule. For example, if we buy material, um, we have to wait for that material to be on site before we can erect it. And so what we do is when we have bid day, we get material timelines. Say, bar joists might take six months like a precast panel might take eight months, whatever. So we schedule the project based on when we can get material. It's not fun, um, but we do the best we can with the information that we have right now. If you can lock in no, you can lock in no figures. I heard you the last meeting you say that whenever it comes, that's what you pay. Uh, not on everything. Um, we can lock in on some, on certain material, but 
what's happening uh, by the time, uh, say we order equipment, we have some companies that aren't holding that number like they used to. You know, used to be they'd hold it for 90 days. Now it's a couple of weeks. And so we try to lock them in. But there's a little clause in some of those contracts that we have to pay for what they had to pay for it when they get it. I mean, that's kind of the supply chain issue we're having right now. Um, it's not substantial, but what we do is we put a contingency in a project that allows for those kind of items. Um, we just did Film Creek's uh, budget last week, and we have a contingency in place for inflation items during the project. So we handle a lot of that through construction contingencies that we're seeing in the market. It's kind of a guesswork, to be honest with you, as far as pinpointing uh, what inflation is going to do over the next year. If, uh, if inflation will be at 10 to 15 percent over the, uh, the duration of this project, land values do what they always do, they will come down. Yeah. If the valuation of the district drops from 450 to 300, what will we do? Yeah, I can't prognosticate that. I'm just a dumb contractor. But, uh, <laughs> well, we and, but, but in answer to that part of the question, once you choose that financing route and those rates you will lock in, those will get locked in as soon as as you know, the board would make a decision, we're gonna do a QC pop bond, we're gonna do a lease purchase, whatever, whatever that configuration ends up being, you know, as soon as those get marketed, those rates are locked. So they're not gonna change. And the other thing that that does lock in too is like the three cents that you can do on a QC pop bond, if valuations would drop so that that three cents no longer covered, the, the cost of the payment, that gets grandfathered in so that you would still be able to, to continue to make those payments. So you you are kind of locked in in terms of having the ability to do the financing. I understand that, but if your district valuation drops by 20, 25%, how do you, what do you have to do? You're not gonna, it's based, the letter's based on the valuation. Your valuation drops by 25 percent. What do you do? Well, your obviously your levy has to go up, and if you don't have the ability for your levy to go up as far as your operational costs, then that's when you're in that situation where you have to look at what are we going to cut in order to continue to to be able to operate the facilities. Fortunately, in terms of the financing that you're talking about here, even if that valuation drops and your, your, your levies have to climb, you're, you're still going to be in a, in a good position to cover the facilities. It's, the, it's really it's your operational costs that you're more likely to run into to issues with if your levy gets to that point where you know, $1.05 is the maximum that you can levy. Um, if you get to that point, and that's when you're going to probably have to make some decisions. How do we operate more efficiently? What, you know, what can we get by without to operate? Thank you. Chuck, you had a question? <laughs> we have two minutes two, left. Two Go points. Ahead. One of them is uh, several years back, I was on a committee, and we went and we went through Powell State School, met with the school board, and there was talk then about maybe putting in some uh, mobile classrooms down there that would serve the needs of the cafeteria and all the classes, which would have been considerably cheaper at the time. And nothing ever came of it, just kind of dropped. <coughs> What's the numbers of people from Palisade compared to the numbers of people, students from wanting to hear? They have any numbers? I guess it was going to compare, that's why I wanted to. Uh, yeah, we do have that. Uh, we just shared that in a 
based on if the, the residence is closer to which community. All right, just Juanita and Palisade, the kids in preschool through 12th grade, there's 141 kids that live in or closer to Juanita, and 96 students that live in or closer to Palisade. That's about a, ends up being about a 60-40 split. I would just like to add to that. Uh, my son is a kindergartner, and he's learning right now his address. So we're practicing learning 36261. We've got all this, all this, we got all these numbers. And okay, I'm going to the last line and say, What's your town, Max? And he says, Wanita Palisade. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> what's your town? What's the closest to the people that you've done again? Wanita Palisade. Thank you all for coming this evening. The meeting is adjourned.